Hello, my name is David Neves. This is a PowerPoint presentation recorded for, for a Siani webinar on uh, de-agrarianisation. Um, I'm an independent researcher, but also a research associate at PLAS, the Institute for Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies at the University of the Western Cape. And this presentation is entitled De-agrarianisation, Spatial and Social Differentiation in South Africa. Although the emphasis here is really on aspects of social differentiation and their relationship with questions of deagrarianization. Now in this presentation I perhaps um, very ambitiously, over, overly ambitiously, try to do two things. I want to look at this question of deagrarianization and social differentiation, but I want to conclude then by reflecting uh, more expansively on some of the critical questions surrounding deagrarianization. So briefly a context. So firstly, de-agrarianisation is conventionally defined as the um, economic, occupational and spatial movement out of agrarian modes or patterns or, 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 or ways of livelihood making. Um, in the South African context, it's especially evident in the communal areas of the former homelands. And these are the, um, these are the areas, uh, the shaded areas of the, of the map um, visible on this slide. And these are essentially the, the ethnic enclaves um, uh, constructed under, set up um, in the colonial period and uh, solidified and, and uh, formalised uh, further under um, apartheid. Um, so the argument here is that in the South African context, processes of de are particularly evident in the communal areas. And in the communal areas, they reflect a historical legacy of racialized dispossession, the historical formation of, of these uh, native labor reserves, and in general terms, the legacy of structural underdevelopment in the South African economy, and the, um, and, and the way in which uh, structural underdevelopment was counterpoised with uh, uh, processes of, of industrial development elsewhere in the, um, in the white controlled and, and industrial economy. Um, that's the historical legacy. But in the present day, processes of uh, deagrarianization are sustained by the highly dualistic and un unequal uh, nature of South Africa's agrarian structure, with its bifurcation, its division between um, the commercial agricultural areas of the countryside, historically white owned, and the um, uh, communal areas, which were, um, which were essentially uh, dumping grounds for population surplus to uh, the requirements of the South African economy. Um, unfortunately, the highly dualistic and unequal agrarian structure in South Africa persists to this day. Um, the post-apartheid state has has really struggled to reverse um, a lot of that, a lot of this uh, legacy. Um, so that's intertwined with the perpetuation of, of processes of deagrarianization, the legacy of deagrarianization, but it's also processes of deagrarianization also tied to other factors, sometimes at a, at a different scale in a sense, um, such as household level dynamics, in particular the gendered and generational contestations and even difficulties um, that households have uh, at mobilizing kin labor um, in order to engage in agriculture. So there, in other words, a whole, a whole range of levels of explanation for um, why we see and continue to see uh, processes of deagrarianization playing themselves out in the South African context. And of course, um, South Africa here is, is a fairly extreme example, and a well-known example, um, but it's, I think, helpful to bear in mind that it's not entirely exceptional. South Africa shares commonalities with other, uh, particularly former settler um, native labor reserve societies of Southern and Eastern Africa. Um, the argument in this uh, PowerPoint presentation is that these processes of deagrarianization are intertwined with processes of rural social differentiation. Um, so they there's a, a recursive relationship where they, in a sense, feed into each other. Um, 
and while they are spatial, um, they are definitely elements of spatial sort of variation uh, between um, uh, various contexts in the communal areas of the former homelands. Uh, our particular focus here is on rural social differentiation. Um, uh, rural livelihoods uh, in contemporary South Africa, in present day South Africa, are um, are crucially shaped by labour market linkages and state welfare transfers, and I want to tease these out in a little bit more detail. So this is the argument that um, uh, contemporary processes of, of rural livelihoods, sustaining and making rural livelihoods in the South African context, particularly in the um, communal areas of the former homelands, are sustained by links to usually formal and urban um, labour markets. Uh, these are sometimes direct, um, but they're also sometimes um, mediated through the kinds of kin-based remittances that, that, that have often, that have long marked uh, rural lives and livelihoods in the South African context. Uh, the second um, sort of major factor or source of resources in processes of um, processes of of the ways in which uh, rural populations in South Africa continue to survive are the state welfare transfers that I've already alluded to, or as they're colloquially called in the South African context, social grants. Um, South Africa is relatively relatively unusual um, for a developing country context in having a, a fairly extensive um, system of cash transfers to, uh, to poor people. Um, and of course the poor are overwhelmingly um, Africans. Um, so over a, over 30 percent of the population receive um, a state a state welfare grant in the South African context. Um, uh, many of these are relatively small, so something like the child support grant uh, has a relatively low value, um, but it is, for example, received by the vast majority of, of children in the South African context, or more accurately, um, by the caregivers of the vast majority of children in the South African context. The, um, uh, the sort of third source of livelihoods or livelihood making in the South African context are various informal economic activities. These are often small scale, often survivalist economic activities. Um, the informal sector, the informal economic sector is comparatively small in the South African context. The um, fourth and final source or dimension of rural livelihoods, uh, rural livelihood making, are various agricultural agrarian activities um, and the accessing of, of land-based affordances or endowments, and various forms of agricultural production, but also natural resource harvesting um, and and things like that. And and, and this this uh, is also within the sort of realm of ecosystem services. So this is the collecting of uh, firewood, harvesting of wild foods, etc. Um, but it's, it is helpful to to bear in mind that um, uh, South Africa, even the countryside, even the communal areas of the former homelands, are profoundly deagrarianized. So the rural poor um, uh, do not. Um, they rely on own production for only a minority of their food needs. So even the poor, um, unemployed rural population predominantly source their food from supermarkets. Uh, that's that's the essential point. Um, so uh, this is not to say that um, various land-based activities, agricultural production, is inconsequential. Um, it often augments. Uh, the food security of rural households. Um, it's simply the point that South Africa is neither um, a, uh, a rural, um, predominantly rural society, uh, nor does it have an agrarian-based economy. So 60% of the South African population is urbanized, and agriculture, even formal sector commercial agriculture, in other words, the kind of agriculture that doesn't really um, uh, occur, isn't yeah, isn't undertaken in the in the communal areas. Um, uh, all agriculture, including its um, upstream and downstream linkages in the South African context, only accounts for roughly a tenth of, of GDP. So in a very profound sense, South Africa isn't, uh, doesn't have uh, an agrarian or doesn't have a, an agricultural economy. South Africa is highly industrialized um, with, a, um, with, uh, with a substantial service sector in its 
component to its economy. Um, so uh, we're going to um, move along and, and look at this question between, uh, of the relationship between deagrarianization and social differentiation. But I, I also, before we do that, I also sort of want to point out that um, uh, rural households are not, um, are not isolated. They're not islands in, in, in a sea of r rurality. They often are profoundly connected to, to the urban, to urban labor markets and um, uh, urban-based households, etc. And um, a colleague and myself came up with a, what we call the typology of rural household connectedness um, a number of years ago. And it's, it's schematically useful um, in, in, in showing, illustrating this dynamic. So in this, so we have a, um, I guess a, a quadrant, uh, four four parts, um, and each um, the table in front of you, and um, uh, each of the f four quadrants is is uh, numbered, um, and we'll start with number one. So number one is uh, rural households with an urban pole, number two is rural households without an urban pole. Um, three is urban households with a rural pole, and four is urban households without a rural pole. Um, so essentially what we, what we often see in the South African context and the ways in which households are formed and, and, and function is they are often geographically or spatially stretched between urban and rural poles. Um, and in many cases, returning to quadrant one here, rural households with an urban pole, they have uh, they geographically stretch to um, to other kin or household members that uh, that would be living in an urban um, in a in an urban context. So uh, many rural households have a corresponding urban pole. In other words, uh, the households in quadrant number one are often linked to households in quadrant number three, and of course. Uh, Urban, many um, urban households, especially impoverished African urban households, i.e. households in number three, um, have kind of corresponding rural poles. So they have, you know, so one will encounter um, an urban household and it will, it will have a, um, linkages to, uh, to rural areas. Now, so, so the essential point here is that one and three um, are often interlinked and connected. Now, um, uh, it's also possible to find uh, rural households without an urban pole. So this is, uh, these are the households, this is quad, quadrant number two. Um, so these are rural households without an urban pole. And um, over many years of livelihoods-based research, it's, it's become very apparent that these frequently represent some of the sort of poorest and most vulnerable and marginalized of rural households. Um, uh, linkages to, to urban resources, labour markets, opportunities are a major determinant of um, rural livelihoods and uh, rural households without these linkages invariably are some of the most vulnerable and, um, and impoverished. Um, in the interest of completeness, there's of course also um, cell, no uh, cell number four and these are urban households without rural poles. And in the context of um, uh, African households, um, these can often be one, one of two sort of variants. Um, sometimes they're um, urban-based households that have lost their linkages um, to their sort of rural safety nets, um, and um, and they're in the in the in the urban areas, but they are also um, quite precarious and vulnerable households. Uh, but in many cases, uh, these are urban households that have. Um, that have made a an urban transition, so they've they've gained a foothold in urban labour markets and economy, and they're doing quite quite well. And they have um, they might maintain some kind of emotional affective link to rural areas, you know, um, keep in touch with rural kin or visit at Christmas time. But these these more affluent types of households in um, in cell number four, uh, they they typically aren't substantially reinvesting, for example, in, in rural areas. Um, that's often a, a yardstick of, of what kind of households they are. Um, so in terms of the research, um, 
essentially this research drew on several years of, of work, um, highly area-based, and essentially combined a quantitative analysis, um, largely from large national data sets, census data, general household survey, and even the National Income Dynamics Study um, data, uh, a longitudinal survey of a number of households. It combined data from those large uh, statistical data sets um, with a whole lot of um, uh, in-depth uh, qualitative uh, inquiry uh, within very particular districts in the, um, the former Transkei region of the current day Eastern Cape. So it forms a participatory inquiry and the development of in-depth household case studies over a number of years. Um, and some of the images on the screen kind of show the uh, show the, uh, the sort of both the uh, area-based um, spatial data from census, but also the on-the-ground nuanced um, qualitative work. And from this, uh, we developed a typology of rural households. Um, which I'm going to speak at in, in, in some detail. Um, uh, so in terms of um, in terms of the sort of takeaways from, from this presentation, we here I'm here suggesting that um, processes of deagrarianization and differences between households are shaped by um, linkages to, uh, to labor markets. Um, often formal and urban labour markets, but also uh, receipt of state welfare transfers or social social grants um, in the in the South African context. Um, and it's it's useful to think in these terms um, because it suggests that processes of deagrarianisation are not um, homogenous; they don't uh, impact or play themselves out uh, evenly across uh, all households uh, within a given rural area, for example. Um, I want to conclude this presentation by posing three critical questions. The first is, um, is, I, is I think there are, there are questions about how we understand deagrarianization, the extent and the trajectories of agricultural or agrarian decline, um, including, I think, there are a whole set of questions around reversals and, and even um, some often quite intriguing evidence around reanimation. And this is partially about those um, local elite households, the top 5%, and the ways in which uh, some of those households, not all of them, but some of them, um, choose to uh, use um, uh, wage earnings, for example, and reinvest in rural areas and agricultural production. And this, um, I think, this, this partially sort of accounts for and is reflected in um, in some sort of quite local geographies and areas, processes of um, yeah, uh, reanimation or re-engagement with agriculture. The second set of critical questions or issues um, are about the sort of enduring problem of measurement and data issues. Um, uh, and the question of to what extent um, do we capture uh, all the um, agricultural and agrarian related activities in a, in a given context. And of course, there are other, other researchers that have done work in the South African context um, that have often uh, catalogued the, uh, the, the wide array of um, often hidden, um, hidden to researchers, um, agricultural or land based activities. And, and I think there, there's an enduring kind of question about uh, the extent to which uh, we are accurately um, capturing. The extent and the process and the change over the changes over time associated with deagrarianization, and the third critical question is is um, is, a, is a centers around a, a series of conceptual issues, and this is quite tricky to explain, but it's um, it's a sort of wider conceptual question around I mean, to what extent um, uh, does uh, the, the sort of normative desirability of agrarian or agricultural production. Um, colour the way in which uh, we understand uh, deagrarianisation. So, um, uh, in other words, um, to what extent is our concern and our focus and our findings um, around the agrarian associated with 
this normative desirability of, of agricultural production, and assumptions about the linear teleological trajectory of national and ag um, agricultural development and national development. Um, I'm going to leave that uh, question hanging, and thank you for your attention.